Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on crimes and punishment and in this lecture we shall have a look at the theories of punishment. So why do we give punishment and what are the theories of punishment? So let us begin by considering the reality. Some facts to consider. It is costly for the society to keep criminals, provide them with food and medicines and ensure their safety. So basically, if you are putting a person in jail, you have to provide that person with food and medicines and you have to ensure their safety. And all of these are costly things. Most prisons in our country and abroad are overcrowded. So there are lot many people as compared to the facilities that the prisons were made to adhere to. A large fraction of crimes are committed by those under the age of 25, meaning that if we decide to keep them incarcerated, we will have to provide for them for a very, very long time. And many crimes are committed by those under severe depression. So this is the state of matters. It is costly, prisons are overcrowded, a large number of people are young people and people might be suffering from severe depression or other mental illnesses. Now, given these scenarios, should we be keeping people in jails at all and for how long? So basically, the society needs to do a cost benefit analysis. There are huge costs involved if you put a person in the jail, especially when you do not have adequate facilities, especially when your jails are already very overcrowded. You will have to provide them with food, you will have to provide them with medicines, you will have to give them security, you will have to furnish a large number of their needs. So should we be doing that? And especially so when a large number of crimes are committed by young people and those people that have things like depression or other mental illnesses. So in that case, is it even just to keep those people in the jails? or should there be some other, uh, some other options. Now, in this case, we have this case law, R. V. Aluwalia. Now, th this is from a British case. So, R. V. Aluwalia stands for the Queen versus Aluwalia. R stands for Regina. So, it is the King or the Queen. So, in this case, in 1992, we had the Queen. So, it is the Queen versus Aluwalia. Now, the case was that Kiranjit Aluwalia, an India born woman, burnt her husband Deepak to death in 1989 in the UK. So, this is a case of murder. There is a woman who has burnt her husband to death. Now, the first thing is should we be punishing this woman? And a large number of you would say yes, because she committed a crime. And we saw before that motive is not considered. It is only the intention that is considered. Intention, preparation, attempt and commission are the four stages of crime. Motive does not come into the picture. So, if she had the intention, if she made the plannings, if she attempted to murder her husband and when she has already succeeded in murdering her husband, then all four stages of crime have successfully been committed. And so, a large number of us would say that yes, she should be put in jail or she should be given some punishment. Now, let us look at the other side of the story. The case of Kiranjit Aluwalia, what did she have to say? She had suffered from domestic abuse for 10 years, including physical violence, food deprivation and marital rape. So, it is not that it was a very happy marriage. She was suffering from domestic abuse for 10 years. 
and her family did not help, citing that she must remain with her husband to maintain family honor. She even tried to run away, but was found by her husband, brought back and beaten. And on one evening in 1989, she was again attacked by her husband who tried to break her ankles and to burn her face. Now, if we look at this part, then a large number of us would now start to begin to have sympathy for this woman. Okay, she was not a bad woman to begin with. She had her own set of problems. She was suffering from domestic abuse. She was being beaten. She was denied food. She was being burned. She was in number of things were going on and her family were also not helping her. Now, if you look at these sorts of scenarios, then we might begin to think that, okay, this is not a bad woman. Probably she does not deserve a huge punishment, but still she should be given some punishment, right? Because after all, she has committed a murder. Now, how did she murder her husband? She mixed petrol with caustic soda to create napalm. Now, napalm is a substance that if you bring it to fire, if you set it alight, then it will keep on burning. Even if you pour water to it, it will keep on burning. So, she did not burn her husband in a normal way. She created napalm and she poured this napalm over her, her sleeping husband and then set it alight. And when this was done, Deepak suffered from severe burns and died 10 days later in the hospital. Now here again, if you look at this mode of burning her husband to death, now if you think about the point of view from her husband, then we might even say that, okay, this person was a bad person, Deepak was a bad person, he had done his own sets of offenses. So Deepak should have been brought to trial. Because if you look at things such as domestic abuse, then yes, the law provides for incarceration, the law provides for punishment, but the punishment is not a death penalty. He did not deserve to suffer death because of the offenses that he had done. So probably he was given a much bigger punishment as compared to what the law would have provided to Deepak. So if Kiranjit took the matter into her own hands, and if she gave her husband a much bigger punishment, then is she not guilty of violating the law herself? So now again, think about what quantum of punishment should you be given, giving to Viranjit. Now the prosecution argued that although she had been threatened with burning, the fact that she waited until her husband had, had gone to sleep was evidence that she had time to cool off. So, this murder that was done was not a murder that was out of a sudden or grave provocation. So, basically, if you are being attacked and in your self-defense you even kill somebody, then that is acceptable. That comes under general exceptions if you are killing somebody in self-defense. Now, in this case, the matter was not that Deepak was trying to burn her. And so she acted in self-defense and in this process Deepak got burnt. No, that was not the case. The thing was, she had waited for Deepak to sleep and then she poured napalm to, over Deepak and then she put it alight. So this was not a heat of the moment. She had time to cool off. And at the same time, she had planned the murder. Evidenced by the fact that her prior knowledge to mix caustic soda with petrol to create napalm was not common knowledge. Now, if you look at this argument that she had made elaborate plannings, she had read about how to make napalm because not everybody knows how to make napalm. So, if you look at it from this point of view, then now you might be thinking that no, she was a vicious woman because she made these elaborate plannings. So, it was not a heat of the moment and at the same time, she had researched into the matter. She had researched into how to make napalm and to use it to kill her husband. 
so probably now here again you will think that okay he probably deserves a much bigger sentence than what we had thought about in the very beginning the appellant did not give evidence that is the side of kiranjit ahluwalia did not give any evidence no medical evidence was adduced on her behalf her case was that she had no intention either of killing her husband or of doing him really serious harm only to inflict some pain on him and provocation was a secondary line of defense so what kiranjit said is saying is that she had never intended to kill her husband she only wanted to give him pain and this was out of provocation now in this case we have seen that it was not that much provoked because she had time to cool down so now what do you think about it so in this case kiranjit was sentenced to punishment and then we have the case of appeal now three grounds of appeal were raised the first two related to the learned judges directions to the jury on provocation so three grounds of of appeal were raised from kiranjit's side the first two were related to what were the directions that the judge gave to the jury about provocation and both of these grounds were turned down it was found that the judge had given the, the exactly the right directions to the jury but then kiranjit's conviction was overturned in 1992 on grounds of insufficient counsel so there were three grounds of appeal the two were turned down but on the third ground the case was overturned she was set free kiranjit had not been aware that she could plead guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility now what is diminished responsibility it is an unbalanced mental state that is considered to make a person less answerable for a crime and to be grounds for a reduced charge but that does not classify him as insane now we have seen before that when a person commits a crime and if it turns out that the person did not have mens rea or he he or she did not have the capability to have a mens rea things like a very small child or an insane person they are given certain leniencies now the court held that kiranjit could have pleaded for diminished responsibility diminished responsibility means that even though the person is not insane but has such unbalanced mental state that it is sufficient to say that the person is less answerable for a crime and the court overturned her case on the grounds that kiranjit had not been aware that she could plead guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility so this thing was not told to kiranjit and so the court overturned the judgment and set her free in addition it was brought to light that she was suffering from severe depression when she set fire to her husband which her new counsel argued had then altered her decision making abilities so why did she have a diminished responsibility because she was suffering from severe depression now this was the case that was put up what did the court say the court said we have been shown a report which was available before the trial from a recognized medical practitioner for the purposes of the mental health act the doctor expressed the opinion that the appellant was suffering from endogenous depression at the material time so at the time that the incident occurred she was suffering from endogenous depression and the court said that endogenous depression is a condition which in the opinion of some experts would be termed a major depressive disorder so the court accepted the fact that she was suffering from depression it is unclear how this potentially important material came to be overlooked or was not further pursued at the time of the trial so this is what the court had to say now just think about it we earlier thought that okay kiranjit had committed a murder so she should be punished then we saw that okay she had suffered from certain abuses and so the punishment should be lowered then we came to know that no this woman had planned things and she had time to cool down so basically she had made elaborate plannings she had read about how to make napalm 
So we again thought that no, a greater amount of punishment is warranted. But then finally the court says that no, she was, was suffering from depression and so she should be let free. So basically the point I want to highlight here is that when we talk about punishment, it is not very easy to come up with the exact quantum of punishment. It all depends on what kinds of facts were brought in front of the court and the quantum of punishment that is given may not be the correct punishment at times. And the courts themselves can overrule their decisions, which is why we have these elaborate processes of appeal. Now, if that is the situation, then should we be giving a punishment at all? Because we at times do not know if the crime or the offense is so great or not as to deserve the punishment. So should we be giving punishment at all? And if yes, then what type of punishment? Why are we punishing somebody? Now, in this case, Kiranjit's case, helped raise awareness of domestic violence in families of non-English speaking immigrants to Western countries and changed the laws for domestic abuse victims in the United Kingdom. So with time, she turned out to be a celebrity because she started to tell people about domestic violence and because of her case, people came to know about domestic violence. Her case known as in British legal textbooks as R. V. Aluvalia changed the definition of the word provocation in cases of battered women to reclassify her crime as manslaughter instead of murder the same year as her appeal leading to the freeing of these two women. So basically her case led to changing of the definition of this word provocation. So it was a landmark case. Because of her case certain other women were let free. So now in this case is Kiranjit a villain or she, is she a hero? So basically, our thought processes change a lot depending on what is coming in front of us. Later on, Kiranjit was honored in 2001 as the first Asian woman uh, in the first uh, Asian woman award in recognition of her strength, personal achievements, determination and commitment in helping to bring to light the substance of domestic violence. She wrote an autobiography with a co-author and the book is called Circle of Light. And this same story was later fictionalized into a film called Provoked, which was screened at the 2007 Cannes Film Festival where Aishwarya Rai played the role of Kiranjit. So basically, when we think about crimes and punishments, the bottom line that is coming up here is that it's not a very straightforward, it's not a very easy process. And if you are punishing somebody and later on it turns out that the quantum of punishment was a bit too much, then probably justice will be defeated. And so, especially in cases when we are, we are giving huge amounts of punishments, we have to be very careful. So, let us now look at why do we need punishment at all. So, why is punishment required? Punishment is required to prevent the occurrence of crime. So you want to avoid the occurrence of crime, to punish the transgressor or the criminal because he or she has done something wrong, so there is a need to punish the person, to compensate the victims as far as possible. Now this compensation is at times a mental compensation because if you have been wronged, then you might be feeling a lot of anger, a lot of anguish and if the, if the wrongdoer is punished, then it will bring some closure into your life. So this would be some sort of a compensation to the victim. Or at times you might even say that the criminal should pay the victim such and such amount of money as compensation. Or you can think about rehabilitating the transgressor or criminal. So in this case you will say that okay this person has committed a crime but he or she committed this crime because he or she had a bad state of mind. Can we reform this person? Can we reform his or her thought process? So that is the aim of rehabilitation. You are trying to convert a criminal into a good citizen. So that can also be an objective of punishment to rehabilitate the transgressor or the criminal. 
to deter the offenders from committing any offenses in the future. So, you want to stop them from committing any other offenses, not just the occurrence of crime, but in this particular case, you are talking about this particular offender that because he or she has already committed a crime, we want to ensure that he or she does not commit any future crimes and to maintain law and order in the society. So, these are all different reasons because of which we might want to give a punishment. Now, depending on the reasons and depending on the society's point of view, there have been several different theories of punishment. So, these theories tell us why a punishment is required and what, of, what sort of punishments should we be giving to the people. So, these are the theories of punishment. Based on the society's attitude towards the lawbreaker, there are five theories of punishment. The first is the retributive theory. Now, retribution means revenge. So, this is a revenge theory. It says that the objective of punishment is to get revenge. Thus, punishment should match the severity of the crime, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So, basically, if the criminal has wronged somebody, then it is the right of that person who has been wronged to seek revenge against the criminal. And so, whatever the criminal has done, you should put an equal punishment to the criminal. If he has taken away one eye of the victim, the victim should take away one eye of the criminal. So, as to get an adequate revenge. But here the thing is, if you take an eye for an eye, then will the victim get an adequate compensation? Is the wrong righted or not? Now, this theory would say that if the victim is able to extract revenge from the criminal, then the wrong has been righted. Punishment helps satisfy the emotion of, retri of retributive indignation or anger that is stirred up by the injustice. And you need to satisfy this emotion. So, if you have been wronged, you will feel very angry and by taking revenge, you will be cooled down. And in this case, punishment is an end in itself. It is not a means of achieving a social security. So, you are not saying that by taking away an eye for an eye, the criminal would be turned into a good person. No, we are not saying that. We are not using punishment as a means to do something. Punishment is not a means to, to, to social security. Punishment is an end in itself. Punishment is the goal. If you give an equal punishment, so that the person is able to extract the revenge, then that is good enough as per this theory. Another theory is the deterrence theory. So, in the deterrence theory, you try to deter the occurrence of a crime, to discourage things. The objective of punishment is to deter or discourage people from committing crimes. So, this theory says, that punishment is basically a check on others who are evil minded and even death penalty is okay if it is an adequate deterrence. So, basically you want to put a fear into the minds of the would be criminals, so that they are discouraged from doing the crime. So, basically in place of retribution an eye for an eye, the deterrence theory would say murder for any person who takes out an eye. That is death penalty for the person who takes out an eye. So, the punishment has to be so large that people are discouraged because of the quantum of the punishment. So, this theory says that even death penalty is okay. It is okay even for smaller crimes if it provides us an adequate deterrence. Then we have the preventive theory. The preventive theory says that the objective of punishment is to prevent crime, not to avenge it. So, if a crime has occurred, you should not try to get revenge for it. You should only try to prevent crimes in the future. And how are you going to prevent the crimes? By controlling the recurrence of crime by incapacitating the offenders. So, it says that if there is a person who is an offender who has committed a crime, so, this person has a criminal mentality. So, you just take this 
criminal and put him in a jail. So, if you have locked up this person, then this person cannot commit any future crimes. So, he is prevented from doing crimes in the future. Or you kill that person, give him or her a death penalty. So, if the criminal is, is dead, then he or she cannot do a future crime. Exile that person. That is, you transport him or her for life to some other place. And if you do these, if you imprison people, if you give them death penalty, if you exile them, then these criminals get incapacitated to repeat the crimes. So, they are now no longer in a position to do the crime. So, this theory would also say that, okay, you can give death penalty, you can even uh, put people to Kalapani or you can uh, put people to jail for the whole of their lives, so as to ensure that they do, they do not commit any future crime. So, the main objective is prevention. So, if there is uh, a bad apple, you just take it out of the system. Then we have the reformative theory. Now, reformative theory is a very recent theory. And this theory says that the objective of punishment is to reform the criminal. So, you are trying, trying to mend the criminal, change his or her ways, so as to prevent him for, from committing a future crime. As Gandhi said, hate the sin, not the sinner. So, in this case, what you are trying to do is to change the criminal, reform the criminal, so that once you have changed him, it is the same person, it is the same body, but the mind has been changed and so he or she no longer has any criminal tendencies. So, this is what the reformative theory is aiming at. You are not trying to extract a revenge, you are not trying to prevent a future crime by incapacitating the person. You are not giving a huge quantum of fines so that people are afraid of committing crimes, but this theory just says that okay, if somebody has committed a crime, then it does not mean that that particular person is a bad person who cannot be reformed. Let us change that person. After all, that person is also a part of our society. So, let us change his or her ways so that he or she becomes a good citizen. So, that is the reformative theory. It is a more contemporary trend in penology. Penology is the science of punishments and this is a more contemporary trend. That is, this is a recent advance in penology and attitudes towards criminals. It talks about proportionality of punishment to offense. So, basically, if there is a small offense, you should not give a very huge amount of punishment so as to deter other people. The punishment has to be proportional to the crime. So, for a small offense, you should give a smaller punishment. For a large offense, you should give a larger punishment. But the aim is not to extract revenge or to incapacitate the person. The aim is only to keep him or her in the jail for a period of time till you are able to reform this person. So, you are going to give this person certain classes or yoga classes or you will provide him or her with books, you will encourage this person to study and you will try to bend his or her ways. It talks about individualization of punishment. So, it says that no two cases are alike and if there is a person who can be uh, reformed easily, then probably a shorter duration is good for that person. If a person is a hardened criminal, then you will for the same punishment, you will give that person a much longer duration of punishment, so that you have adequate time to reform the person. It talks about humane treatment, that is you have to treat criminals as human beings, not just as criminals, because if you just treat them as criminals, if you just go on punishing them, then they will turn out to be more hardened criminals. So, let us not do that. Let us treat them as good human beings and if we treat them as good human beings, probably they will convert into good human beings is what this theory is saying. It talks about rehabilitation of the criminals, correction and adjust and readjustment to the society. So, at times this theory even postulates that if there is a criminal, 
you should let that criminal mingle with the society under supervision of course but let this person mingle with the society let this person atone for his or her sins and give this person a second chance give him or her an employment make him or her worthy of the society and by doing all of these you will be able to reform the criminal it replaces tortuous methods of punishment with monetary fines and damages there is no need to torture the person the criminal you can if you can make do with monetary fines and damages that are sufficient to reform the person then let that be and it says no to death penalty death penalty is only permitted in the rarest of rare cases where you have a person who just cannot be reformed otherwise take your time and reform the person if you kill a person by giving him or her the death penalty then there is no way to reform the person so it abhors death penalty it says no to death penalty unless it is a rarest of rare case where you are absolutely sure that this person is so vicious so heinous that he or she cannot be reformed at all an example is that a person commits brutal murders and dacoity and becomes a big problem for the government the government asks for the person's surrender and upon surrender the government assures as a condition that there will be relaxation during prosecution provided that the offender will promise to lead a peaceful life the dacoit becomes a good citizen and later on even gets elected as an mp now in this case what the the government is trying to do is the government is saying that okay we are going to relax you from your prosecution there will be a smaller punishment we are not going to give you a death penalty or a life imprisonment provided you surrender and provide and provided that you lead a peaceful life and in this case the person who was earlier a dacoit becomes a good citizen and later on even becomes a public representative so isn't this a win win situation for all now this is an example of reformation you have not provided a huge amount of punishment you have not killed the person but you have transformed this person into a good citizen and such a good citizen that he or she can even become a public representative so this is the objective of the reformative theory then we also have the multiple approach theory now this theory says that every theory all the previous four theories they have their own merits and demerits every criminal is different from the next criminal every criminal is different from the previous criminal every circumstance is different and so a single theory is often insufficient to deal with the multitude of cases and a combination of theories must then be employed by the courts of law so the multiple approach theory is saying that if you just took retributive theory for your society then you cannot deal with all the cases if you just take deterrence theory or preventive theory or reformative theory you cannot deal with all the cases all the cases are different in some cases you will have to extract revenge in some cases you will have to give a huge punishment so that other people are deterred from doing a similar similar crime in some cases you have to put people out for imprisonment for life or imprisonment for very long terms so that these people who are not uh, responding to things they are kept away from the society the society is protected and in other cases you can use reformation so the multiple approach theory says that because every case is different every circumstance is different so let us not stick with any of these particular theories for a society and let the courts decide which particular theory is best suited for a particular case so that is the multiple approach theory every criminal is different every circumstance is different and so a single theory is insufficient to deal with all cases and a combination of theories 
must then be applied by the courts of law. So, what does our Supreme Court have to say about all these? Let us look at some judgments of the Supreme Court. The Honorable Supreme Court of India in Muhammad Giyasuddin versus State of Andhra Pradesh on 6th of May 1977. Now, here the Supreme Court is saying, we strongly feel that the humanitarian winds must blow into the prison barricades. More than this is expected in this decade when jail reforms from abolition of convicts costume and conscript labor to restoration of basic companionship and atmosphere of self-respect and fraternal touch are on the urgent agenda of the nation. So, what the Supreme Court is saying here is that you do not treat a criminal just as a criminal. Treat the person as a human being. So, earlier what used to be the situation is that if you went to a jail, you would find that all the criminals are wearing a particular uniform, the jail uniform. All the criminals are being tortured in some way or other. Now, the Supreme Court is saying that this thing has to stop. We strongly feel that humanitarian winds must blow into the prison barricades. That is, the prison should have a more humanitarian outlook. What kinds of things are required? What kinds of things are being done? Jail reforms. Abolition of convicts costume. Conscript labor. That is, putting people to work. From all of these, now we are shifting to restoration of basic companionship. That is a place of solitary confinement or in place of a confinement where you are not allowed to meet your family members, you are not sh now shifting to restoration of basic companionship. These days, in a large number of prisons, conjugal rights are also permitted, which means that the spouse of the criminal can come to see him or her in privacy. So, you now start to Think of a criminal not just as a criminal but as a human being and start to give some humane treatment to the person. Try to ensure that he, is, he does not convert into a hardened criminal. So, this is what the Supreme Court is saying. Atmosphere of self-respect and fraternal touch. Fraternal touch is brotherly touch and are on the urgent agenda of the nation. Our prisons should be correctional houses. So, here the Supreme Court is saying that the prisons have to be places of reformation, places of correction, not places of punishment. So, our prisons should be correctional houses, not cruel iron arcing the soul. We have given thought to another humanizing strategy, namely guarded parole release every three months for at least a week, punctuating the total prison term. So, the Supreme Court is saying that we can even give thought to this process of a guarded parole release every three months. So, every three months for a week, the convict is allowed to go out in a guarded manner in term of a parole release. And this would be done throughout the total prison term. So, every three months, this person would be able to go out for at least a week. So, by all of these, the Supreme Court is saying that let people maintain a touch with the society. Let them not become aloof from the society. Let them be treated in a humanitarian manner. Let prisons be correctional facilities, reformation facilities and not places of punishment where people turn in from criminals to war hardened criminals. So, this is what the Supreme Court said in 1977. In 1978, this is another judgment. The Honorable Supreme Court of India in Narottam Singh versus the state of Punjab and another. So, the Supreme Court says the law of crimes perverts itself on occasions into the crime of law if narrow legalism overwhelms social justice. So, the Supreme Court is saying that if we look at the law of crimes and we look at from a narrow point of view that overwhelms social justice. So, we do not take care of social justice. In those cases, the law of crimes become crimes of law. That is, the law itself has become criminal. The law itself is doing harm to the society, harm to the people. 
if we take a very no, narrow outlook. So, this is what the Supreme Court is saying about our criminal system. The complainant Amrit Kaur was married to the accused. So, this is the accused Narottam Singh and the complainant Amrit Kaur was married to this person. The wife was sent back to her brother. So, the accused sent his wife Amrit Kaur back to her, bro her brother and then picked up intimacy with another woman which ripened into a sort of wedlock. So, what this person did was he sent his wife to her maternal home and then married another person. Thereupon, the complainant charged the accused, namely the husband, the mother-in-law, the second wife and others. So, who are the, uh, the people in the case? The accused, Narutam Singh, the mother-in-law of Amrit Kaur, that is Narutam Singh's mother, the second wife of this person and others. With offences under section 494, that is marrying again during life term of husband or wife. Read with section 109, punishment of abatement if the act abated is committed in consequence and when no express provision is made for its punishment of IPC. So, the charges are that this person married again during the lifetime of his wife and the other people, the mother-in-law, the second wife and others have abated this offence. So, these are the charges. Now, the, the Supreme Court says, what should be the sentence in the present case? The appellant is a businessman and one consequence of his two years imprisonment is that he wrecks his business. So, if you go with the narrow definition, then, the, then these two sections, section 494 and 109 would say that this person should be sentenced to two years in jail. But if you give this person two years in jail and because this person is a businessman, so in these two years, the whole business will be wrecked. This whole business will be next to nothing, which whatever else happens will land his family including one or both the wives in financial misfortune. So, if you jail this person, the only thing that is going to happen is that the business will be wrecked and the whole of his family including one or both the wives will have to suffer the financial misfortune. Secondly, punitive incarceration may not restore the harmony. So, here we are talking about the matters of a husband and a wife. So, if the husband is incarcerated, put to jail, then it is not going to restore the harmony in any case. Thirdly, the reality of the situation is that the man has married a second woman. So, this is the reality of the case. The marriage has already been done. Now, if you look at from the point of view of the first wife, then the first wife has to live, which means financial resources. So, if the appellant wrecks his business, lands into a financial misfortune, then this person Naruttam Singh will not be able to pay his first wife. So, that would be a consequence. So, the, the first wife has to live, which means financial resources are required. She has to have a future which certainly cannot rest with a betrayer. So, of course, because this person has betrayed his wife, so we will not ask the first wife to live with this person because she cannot have a future with the, with the betrayer. Taking the totality of these circumstances into consideration, we felt that the best course would be to have the offence compounded for which the parties were readily willing, appreciating the pragmatism of life. So, the Supreme Court is saying that in place of giving two years of jail, let us compound this case. So, let us take a fine and close the matter. So, this is the award that was given. We incorporate the settlement as part of this judgment as an annexure, sufficient repatriation. So, this person has to give his first wife sufficient amount of money for uh, as a form of repatriation. Then this person will not be sent to jail, so he is acquitted. Following upon the composition will hopefully save his business and avoid the hurtful jail term. 
so by this compromise or by this statement the business would be saved so they will not land in financial trouble it will avoid the hurtful jail term and we also give our consent to divorce that is the first wife can now take a divorce from this person so if we took the narrow view if you just looked at what the ipc section said we would have jailed this person for 2 years which would have resulted in a situation that is not good for anybody so the supreme court wisely avoided this situation next this is another case the honorable supreme court of india in in m h foscourt versus the state of maharashtra 1978 now the previous case was 1978 this again is 1978 now in this case the supreme court has said a very different thing from the previous two ones the supreme court says the trial judge has confused between correctional approach to prison treatment and nominal punishment verging on decriminalization of so of serious social offenses that is in the previous two cases the supreme court had given very light sentences the supreme court had given away with giving a jail term but now the same supreme court is saying that the trial judge has confused between a correctional approach to prison treatment and a nominal punishment that is the trial judge has given such a small punishment that it is ultimately verging to decriminalization of serious social offenses the first is basic the second is pathetic so the supreme court is in favor of correctional approach but the supreme court is not in favor of giving nominal punishment for serious offenses so here again we are looking at the multiple approach theory it's not one size fits all you cannot say that in all cases let us do away with incarceration that cannot be done the first is basic meaning that we are completely for correctional approach to prison treatment but the second is pathetic meaning that we are completely against giving a nominal punishment now in this case what we are seeing is that the supreme court is verging towards the multiple approach theory the supreme court is saying that one size fits all approach is not going to work you cannot say that for each and every case we are just going to forego the jail term because if that happens then we are doing decriminalization of offenses which is not what the legislature wanted so we are usurping into their territory soft sentencing justice is gross injustice where many innocents are the potential victim so if you do a soft sentencing if you do not give a harsh punishment then you are resulting in a gross injustice and who will suffer the innocent people who are the potential victims they are going to suffer meaning that for some extent we are also required to put some amount of deterrence so that future potential victims are not victimized so some amount of deterrence again is required it is altogether a different thing to insist on therapeutic treatment hospital setting and correctional goals inside the prison so it is okay if we talk about these even punctuated by parole opportunities for welfare work meditational normalization and healthy self expression so we are okay with all of these so that the convict may be humanized and on release rehabilitated as a safe citizen so we are completely for reformation but the supreme court says coddling is not correctional any more than torture is deterrent so just as we can say that if you give a torture as a punishment and you think that it is going to deter everybody that is wrong but similarly if you give a very small punishment if you just work in favor of the criminals then that is not correctional while iatrogenic prison terms now iatros means treatment genesis is in inducement or creation so the prison terms that are treatment induced they are bad because they dehumanize meaning that if you just give a person a prison term 
trying to treat that person then it may lead to dehumanization and the person may become a more hardened criminal so while this is bad it is a functional failure and judicial pathology to hold out a benignly self defeating non sentence to deviants who endanger the morals and morale the health and wealth of the society so you have to make a balancing act you cannot say that okay let us do away with punishments it is a very goody goody hunky dory thing that is not going to happen so you'll have to take these multiple approaches you'll have to maintain a balancing act in some cases you will have to give a strong punishment that acts as a deterrent in certain other cases you can go with the reformative approaches but these reformative approaches should not turn into a, a judicial pathology that uh, by which the supreme court is saying that we will do away with the sentencing that again is bad because that will have consequences so the supreme court is saying that you have to go with these multiple approaches so to recap we looked at five different theories of punishment the first is the retributive theory and the retributive theory tells that punishment is an end to itself we punish because we want revenge if person if a person has done a crime he should be punished and the society or the victim now in the case of criminal cases the the whole society is the victim so the the society which is the victim should be able to extract its revenge so that the society becomes cooled down it should be able to express its anger in terms of taking the revenge so that is one mode of dealing with things another mode is deterrence you dissuade people you discourage people by showing them the consequences even if somebody does something uh, that is not a very big offense but you will give that person a very big sized punishment so that there is a fear of doing things wrong there is a fear in the mind of a would be criminal that if i do this crime then i will have to suffer this huge consequence that is the deterrence theory then we have the preventive theory and the preventive theory says that the main objective of punishment is to safeguard the society to prevent the crimes occurring by keeping the criminals away from the society so you take the criminals you lock them up so that they are unable to mingle with the society you take the criminals you give them a death penalty so that they are not able to mingle with the society you take the criminals and you put them somewhere else in an inhospitable place a very remote place something like andamans that is the kalapani so in the times of the britishers this was a very prominent thought that you want to safeguard the society so just keep the criminals away from the society keep them locked up so that is the preventive theory you prevent the offenses then we have the reformative theory and the, the reformative theory says that the objective of giving the punishment is not any of these but it is to reform the criminal to convert that criminal into a good citizen so that is the reformative theory how are you going to do that you give you treat that criminal as a human being there has to be a humanizing treatment you provide him or her with opportunities opportunities to read opportunities to study get new degrees learn new skills so that this person becomes valuable to the society at the same time you do not put this person through a torture you do not put uh, or you do not label this person as a criminal you do not put him into convict clothes so that this person retains his or her composure and human values you allow this person to mingle with the society he or she should retain the touch with the society and through things like parole or working out you will try to reform this person into a good citizen so that is the reformative theory and then we have the multiple approach theory 
and the multiple approach theory says that every case is different every criminal is different and so we cannot have a situation of one size fits all now the honorable supreme court in certain cases has said that we have to give punishment looking at the circumstances looking at the society and in certain cases the supreme court has also compounded offenses and given away with uh, the jail terms so in place of incarcerating the criminals the supreme court has said that okay let this person give such and such amount of fine or let this person give such and such amount of money to the victim so that both of these are happy the criminal avoids the jail term whereas the victim gets a financial security the supreme court itself has done these but the supreme court has also said that it's not one size fits all approach and you cannot say that we are not going to give any jail term to anybody because if we start doing that then we might be favoring the criminals so in our country the supreme court has said that we can go with the multiple approach theory and use uh, concepts of all of these different theories so these are all the different theories of punishment so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind Thank you.